All right. Thank you. Is it? Yeah, there we go. Hi. Um, welcome to the Candidates Forum. We'd like to thank Latham and Watkins for donating space, staff, and for recording the forum for us this afternoon. Um, your hosts are Chicago Appleseed, the Chicago Council of Lawyers, and the Chicago Lawyers Chapter of the American Constitution Society. Chicago Appleseed is a research and advocacy organization that is focused on reducing barriers to access to justice in our courts. The Chicago Council of Lawyers is Chicago's oldest public interest bar association. Its membership works for all of Chicago, also to reduce barriers for justice in our courts. ACS is the nation's largest progressive lawyer network. They strive to ensure that the Constitution and the law work for all people, again, by empowering leaders and informing the dialogue. You can join ACS or the Chicago Council of Lawyers at their websites. Our moderator is Maya Duke, Maya Duke Masova um, of the Chicago Reader. She's also a freelance writer, translator, and photographer. Um, we're very glad to have her and her expertise here moderating the panel. The clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County has a unique position with a direct impact on access to our courts. Um, the key to reform is transparency, and the clerk will act as a gatekeeper to our courts. We thank you for taking the time to come today to learn about the office, to hear from the candidates, and we very much appreciate the candidates coming here to tell us their vision for the office and for engaging with the voters in this way. Um, I will leave them to introduce themselves once we get started. If you have questions for the candidates, there are cards on your table. We'll collect them about halfway through the event, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. And now I will turn things over to Maya to start the panel. Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, so just uh, some uh, house rules for how this will go. Um, we're going to uh, start with some a couple of minutes for opening statements for each of the candidates. Um, then um, I'll have some questions. Some of them will be directed at you guys individually. Some of them will be for everybody to answer. Um, then we'll have the audience-based uh, Q&A portion, and then we'll have closing statements. So um, it'll be two minutes for answers, uh, just like with the opening and closing statements. So just a quick show of hands in the room. Um, how many people here have had to deal with the clerk of the circuit court's office through your work? Raise your hands. Okay. How many people here have had to deal with the office because of a personal case in the court? Okay. And how many people have never personally dealt with the office of the clerk of the circuit court? All right. Uh, so with uh, that in mind, now you, you have a better sense of who your audience is here. Um, why don't we start with the opening statements um, uh, candidate Boykin, go ahead. In each of your opening statements, make sure to tell us why you're running, um, what makes you qualified, and uh, who you think the clerk's office serves. Well, thank you very much. I'm Richard Boykin. I'm a lifelong Democrat, and I'm running for clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County. I was born in Mississippi and raised in Inglewood. I'm a proud graduate of Chicago Vocational High School. I graduated from Central State University undergrad and then I graduated from the University of Dayton School of Law. I've been a licensed attorney since 1994. I worked 13 years in Washington for three members of Congress, and uh, I joined, came back to Chicago in 2006, joined the big law firm Barnes & Thornburg, where I worked for 13, a little bit over 13 years um, practicing law, and uh, have had great interaction with the uh, court system, uh, in fact, I've also had my own law firm at one point in time. And so I'm running for clerk of the circuit court because I want to ensure access to justice for everyone. Look, the clerk's office is the front door to our justice system. I want to make sure that that front door is wide open and welcoming. When I was served as a county commissioner in 2014, I transformed the office of county commissioner. And likewise, I want to do the same in the clerk's office. I was a leader in criminal justice reform. I actually uh, helped to steer millions of dollars into restorative justice programs. Uh, we protected rights of individuals from law enforcement misconduct as a county commissioner. 
and did a host of other things as well. I know what it's like to struggle. I grew up in Inglewood, and growing up in a single-parent home, we were on food stamps for a short period of time. But I, because of the promise of education, I was able to become a lawyer. And so I want to take my skills as a lawyer and reform the clerk's office. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, go ahead, candidate Carbonarji. Oh, yes. This. Can you hear me better? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael Cabanargi. I'm candidate for clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County. Uh, my thank you. I'd like to thank the Chicago Appleseed Fund for Justice, Chicago Council of Lawyers, and the American Constitution Society for presenting this today. This is an important public service that you provide, along with the League of Women Voters, to educate voters. Uh, I ask for your support for clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County because I want to bring technology, transparency, and talent to the office while helping make Cook County a more just home. Let's take an office stuck in yesterday, bring it into today, and most importantly, prepare it for tomorrow. I've spent my entire career in public service. I served as an aide to Senator Paul Simon, then for Senator Dick Durbin. I went to law school, graduated with honors, and clerked for Judge William Hibbler in the Northern District of Illinois. While a law clerk, I led the development of the federal court's first pro se help desk in Chicago, and the Federal Bar Association and the U.S. District Court recognized my leadership with the Award for Excellence in Public Service. And as a side note, I'm pleased to report that the Pro Se Help Desk is still helping those who desperately need it and has been renamed for Judge Hibbler. After clerking, I served as a federal prosecutor for the Securities and Exchange Commission, where I investigated and prosecuted fraud and corruption, including insider trading, Ponzi schemes, and other offenses that target working families. The SEC recognized my hard work with both the Director's Award and the Chairman's Award, the latter for my successful effort in combating financial crimes that target senior citizens. Now, as chair of the Cook County Board of Review, I lead the county's, the country's largest property tax appellate office, and I help homeowners pay only their fair share of property taxes and not a penny more. When, when the chief judge appointed me to the board in 2011, the Board of Review was entirely paper-based and only in English. The first thing I did was translate the, forms, the board's documents and forms into Spanish, Polish, Korean, and Mandarin. The next thing that we did was start a robust outreach program, going into the neighborhoods and helping homeowners in the neighborhoods where they live and work on nights and on weekends. And probably the most important thing and the most relevant is I led the development of a digital appeals processing system that's won national awards. It's brought the technology and the transparency that we need at the clerk's office. I have a reform plan like many people up here, but I'm the only candidate that's delivered on a reform plan. I'm leading a county office. I'm leading county procurement, and I'm leading county staff. I've got the track record of success to bring the transformative progressive reform we need for the Cook County Clerk's Office. Thank you. Thank you so much. Candidate Martinez, go ahead. Much. I want to just say thank you to Chicago Appleseed for the opportunity to be here and uh, talk a little bit about myself. Uh, you have done such great work when it comes to important issues and making the court system much more accessible to so many out there that really need uh, the, uh, the, the work that you do. Uh, I'm a state senator in the uh, 20th district. That is Logan Square, Albany Park, uh, and uh, Avondale community. I've been a senator for 18 years. I have actually dedicated my life for the working, you know, for working families, uh, breaking barriers for women. I was the very first Hispanic woman ever elected in the state Senate back in 2003, and I have not stopped working since. Uh, you know, I have, uh, when you talk about work, uh, breaking, breaking barriers for women and people of color, you know how difficult it is. I can see I'm the only woman running, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm ready for the fight. But more important, I, I am not the, I am not an attorney by trade, but I, but I am a lawmaker for the past 18 years. And that really gives me an opportunity to want to bring that experience, uh, all the work that I have done, the legislation that I have passed that has dealt with, you know, with women, you know, that have done with people of color, that have done with story of justice. When we talk about recidivism, we talked about making sure that we have ways of making sure that people get back to work after they've been incarcerated. These are the big issues that I have worked on in, the, in, in Springfield. Uh, you know, and as you can see, after so many years of mismanagement in the county clerk's office, I think it's time for us to really bring out the sunlight and the transparency that's needed in that office. The office is not... It, it, the, everybody talks about the budget constraints and what's going on in the office. I really have to believe that there's, it goes beyond that. There's a culture that, that needs to change, and we have to make that transformation. We need to make sure that people are, have access to uh, the office and not have to take time off work. I want to implement, you know, I want to be able to implement something like, you know, an app or some kind of make sure you can pay your court costs online. These are the kind of things that we need to make sure that we make it easier 
and user friendly for the office to be accessed by the by regular folks that really need the services there. So I'm ready to you know take this fight on, and I hope to be given the opportunity. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, and candidate Meister, go ahead. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank the council. Uh, Appleseed uh, Constitution Society and Latham and Watkins, as well as the League of Women Voters for putting this on. And it's so good to see so many people interested in the clerk's office. It, it's an office that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, unlike my opponents, I have, I'm an attorney. I've spent the last 29 years working in the circuit court of Cook County pretty much on a daily basis. Um, I've worked in every division of the courts, uh, except for one, and uh, all of the courthouses. And it's a very massive system, the second largest court system in the country. I've also worked in courts all around the country, so I know how to compare a good system to a bad system. I see what works in other court systems, and I know what is broken in Cook County. Dorothy Brown came to office uh, in 2000, and it was uh, a, she had a team and a plan in place, and two decades later and hundreds of millions of dollars later, uh, we still have not achieved what she set out to do. I ran four years ago for this office against Dorothy Brown uh, and, and uh, was, I'm proud to say, at that time received the Tribune, Sun-Times, and Daily Herald endorsements because I know how the office works and I know how to fix it. The, the clerk's office is a, a machine-controlled patronage den of disappearing files and dinosaur age technology that needs to be fixed ethically and operationally. It's what I've spent my career doing. I know the folks who work in the clerk's office. I know our judiciary, and I know um, that they all desperately want change, and a lot of them are supporting me. Um, the clerk's job is to make sure that the court system is accessible, navigable, and efficient for all stakeholders with minimal bureaucratic or political interference. I have a very detailed plan of what I'm going to do with the office. It's on your, on your tables. We've handed it's time. Um, it, okay. And anyway, I, I, hope, I, I hope, you know, I'm a reformer, and it's my goal to take this office, which is very mired in politics. And okay. We're going to efficiency we need to keep moving so unless you'd like me to do that to your spiel please keep an eye on the time right in front of you um all right so our first question um uh, it's meant for everybody and i'll go around and and call on candidates um so can each of you choose an area of the cl of, of the clerk's work of the clerk's office and tell us about one specific problem within that part of the office that you'd like to fix and how you plan on doing that. So the clerk's office is responsible for a lot of different kinds of activities, a lot of different kinds of um, uh, work with records. So pick, pick one area of the clerk's work. Tell us about a problem you'd like to fix and no repeats or generalities, please. So um, candidate Carbonargi, we'll start with you. So if I understand it correctly, I get a magic wand? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you're running for office, so realistic uh, solution is probably better. Uh, we don't need a magic wand because we've already done this at the Board of Review. Um, the, the clerk's office needs to embrace technology and embrace digital solutions. Dorothy Brown has fought technology at every step of the way for 20 years. Those of you who practice in federal court like I have for many years know that the courts have used the PACER system for almost 30 years. Courier font, no graphics, very boring, but every lawyer, judge, and practitioner loves it. Uh, the collar counties, Will Lake and DuPage, have had successful online systems. So you have to embrace that technology now because not only is it better for the person who's going in on a landlord-tenant dispute to get the heat turned back on their building. It actually saves money and delivers a better, delivers a better product. At the Board of Review, the digital system that we've built, uh, we've given back nearly all of our warehouse space to the county. 93% uh, of our appeals are filed online. Dorothy Brown just spent $24 million to build a warehouse in Cicero to hold paper. $24 million. Paper now and paper for the future. So the first thing you have to do is embrace digital solutions, as I have, and look for a system you can build on time and on budget, as I have, and move that office from the 20th century into the 21st century. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, candidate Martinez, go ahead. Thank you very much.
much. I think as a, as a senator who has had numerous over the course of the years in my office have many uh, constituents that have walked in and talked about Dirty Brown's office. They talked about how their paperwork, a woman who was looking for you know child support, three different times her paperwork got got was missing. Uh, the the idea that uh, people go there and they have to take time off work. I think the front line of the office is where I really want to start. I want to be able to know that the people who actually are the first receivers of the constituents, they have to be properly trained. And there has been a lack of leadership and training in that office. So the culture is the first thing that I want to be able to change in that office. We have to make sure that we can actually train these individuals so they can actually tell the constituents as they come in where they need to go. Not that, I'm sorry, I cannot offer legal service. That's not good enough for anyone coming into office seeking seeking uh, um, some kind of uh, help from, these, from the system. Women looking for order of protection. This is very important. It could be the life of this woman. So for me, hearing these stories over and over about the lack of leadership, the lack of professionalism in the office, especially with the front line, that will be my first area that I would really want to go in there and retrain because we have a lot of good people that are in there, but they just have that there's been a lack of leadership there. And I think retraining, investing money back in retraining them and making sure that they understand what the clerk office is about and where the solutions are at is the first thing that I will definitely do to make sure that we get started the right way. Okay, thank you. Um, candidate Meister, go ahead. There is a lot that needs to be fixed in the office, and I put forth in my plan. And I, as I said before, it's broken both operationally and ethically. And yes, operationally, it absolutely need to, needs to be fixed. But I think most important is this is an office that is ground zero of what we've seen in corruption and bad practices in Cook County government. We have a current office holder who is selling jobs at the corner bakery across the street from the Daily Center for $15,000. And that's, you know, there's federal indictments. This office needs to be, this office needs to be cleaned up ethically. Um, one of the first things that I believe needs to be done is we need to have strict Shackman standards implemented. Um, make sure that this culture of pay to play and and political uh, political dealing is put to an end and let our employees in the office know that they're no longer going to have to play in politics in order to keep their jobs um, and free the office up from the constraints that have been put on it by the political machine and the entrenched uh, political interests. The office needs to operate ethically you know we've seen in the voters the voters in cook county have made absolutely clear with the election of people like fritz kagi and Lori lightfoot that ethics is the most important thing to instill so yes i want to do a lot operationally but we can't get there until we clean it up ethically and I, i'm proud to say i'm the reformer i'm the only one who's a non uh, who's an outsider to the political system would come into the office, and that's what I want to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Candidate Boykin, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. The question is, uh, what will we do to fix the office? What issue would we champion? So there are a couple of things. One, uh, on day one, we're going to bring accountability to the office. We're going to make sure that we have a motivated staff. Look, we serve at the pleasure of the public, and we ought to serve them and serve them well. And so we're going to fire up the staff and make sure that we have training uh, for everybody, proper training, so that everyone's trained on different processes. And we're going to make sure that uh, people are deployed strategically where they need to be to serve the taxpayers of Cook County. We're going to bring transparency. Uh, we're going to make sure that we do quarterly reports to the taxpayers of Cook County on what it is that we're doing, how many cases we're receiving, and that sort of thing, so that the people really understand what the clerk's office does. We're going to bring integrity on day one. We're going to make sure that we have a plan to get from under Shackman. But then, too, on technology, we're going to make sure that the electronic record, the e-record, is, in fact, the, the record for the court. We're going to make sure that uh, that is the record, and we're going to get rid of paper. We're going to get rid of all the paper that you're seeing in that office. And then we're going to make sure that remote access to documents Right now, currently, uh, lawyers and parties to the case have access, but we want to expand that access to other people as long as we protect people's uh, 
private rights and that sort of thing. But I want to make sure that uh, we do that because we ought to be very transparent for the taxpayers of Cook County, and I know we can get it done on day one. And, you know, quite frankly, I'm tired of folks talking about Clerk Dorothy Brown. I think she's done some good work. Uh, We can denigrate her all you want, but Clerk Brown is not on the ballot. You're on the ballot. Talk about your vision. Don't talk about the past. The past is history. Uh, Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a present. That's why they call it a gift. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so now I have a few questions that are for each of you individually. Um, So, uh, Candidate Meister, I'll start with you. So you're a practicing attorney um, with no experience in elected office. Uh, What advantage will you have uh, over your opponents in this role? And uh, what disadvantage would you have to overcome? Um, I think it gives me great advantage. I am the only one up here who is a political outsider. Um, with the goal of ethically reforming the office, I think that's exactly what is needed is a political outsider who does not have deep ties and long ties to political interests who have historically for decades uh, influenced the office. And I'm going to remain free from those interests and make sure that the office is politically, you know, operates outside of the political realm, which I think is important to maintain a neutral judiciary. Um, I also have very deep uh, operational experience uh, in in industry. I was the chief operating officer for a multi-state company that had offices all over the country and handled operations, um, including computer systems and uh, personnel issues. And I was with a uh, large law firm for many years. I was a hiring partner. So I have uh, a very deep experience administratively. As a matter of fact, I worked with my firm. We did a complete computer uh, transition. And, you know, those are very positive things that I will bring to the office and have experience operating a large office in multi-states with lots of employees. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a net positive to be the political outsider, the only political outsider in this race. And, and um, I don't see much of a downside to it. All right. Uh, so then, um, candidate uh, Kabanarji, the Board of Review has about 120 employees. Uh, the clerk's office has 10 times as many. That's about 1,400 employees. Um, what are you doing to prepare for such a massive um, leadership role change, going from such a small administration to potentially going to a huge one? Right. Great question. It's really a matter of scale. I mean, when I came to the Board of Review eight years ago, I was appointed by the chief judge. I was at the SEC as a prosecutor at the time. Uh, The board had approximately 129 employees, and now our headcount is 141. The number of appeals in that time doubled in eight years. We just closed last Wednesday, and we had 250,000 complaints or so. Our headcount remained relatively flat. So how do you deal with that? Technology. You embrace technology. So in in preparing to gear up to lead the clerk's office, it's the same. It's building out a good team, understanding your technology, understanding your budget constraints that you have. I've dealt with some difficult times at the county uh, helping to run the board of review, and there will be difficult times in the clerk's office going forward. But on day one, I come with that experience. There's zero learning curve. Okay. Uh, Candidate Martinez, um, you've worked on legislation that helped get courtroom interpreters for non-native English speakers. Um, And so I'm wondering which area of the clerk's office do you think is in most dire need of interpreters or non-English language services? Again, I think the front line. I think when uh, people access the office, they have to have someone that either speaks their language or they can explain, you know, what they're there for. Um, I do believe that, you know, there there is an opportunity for uh, for for us to make changes in that office uh, based on the fact that we have a lot of folks that you know that 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 speak you know more than one language. That's going to be something. One of my priorities there is to make sure that we have people that speak different languages that uh, people need uh, as they access that office. But more important, I, I, you know, I, I go back to 
uh, what we need to do to start to kickstart that office uh, back to what it should be, the taxpayer's office, where people have, you know, have to come in for whatever reason. We have to be ready to help them, not send them away or send them disgusted back to some of, some of our offices saying, they don't have no answers for us. We have to be able, there's, there's technology that needs to be developed. We have to make sure that we talk with, uh, with all the other, and I'm talking about making sure that the public defender's office, the chief justice office, the state attorney's office, the sheriff, we have to have a connection. We have to all work together to make sure that we can take this office and bring it to the next level because the only way we're going to be able to connect based on case files and everything else, we have to be able to connect. There's a huge gap right now that does not connect all these offices, and that's what I, that's where I really want to work on. I want to make sure that there is, you know, and the work that I've done in Springfield, that I can bring that experience there, and also that we can take and, 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 and have, like you said, back to the, the, the original question, is making sure there's people that can speak more than one language there to help with that process, and also work with the other entities to make sure that there are also uh, per- people there that speak uh, other languages. Okay, thank you. Um- Candidate Boykin, um, in your time as a county commissioner, um, you were a backer of reductions in government spending and supported um, outsourcing county jobs uh, to contractors and selling county hospital debt. Um, Will you be taking the same approach to uh, the clerk's office if you're elected? First of all, let me correct you. I never outsourced county jobs. Never. And so let's be clear on that. Never did I outsource county jobs. I am someone, though, who, and, and, you know, Jacob says that he's the only political outsider. I beg to differ. I'm the outsider. I'm the guy who got rid of the pop tax, and because of that, I paid a hell of a political price as a result of that. I stood up for the people. Every time I put people over politics, and so I'm not a part of the party establishment and the elite. So, if anything, I'm the outsider up here, and that's why I'm not a county commissioner today. Quite frankly, let me tell you something. When I was a county commissioner, I gave back $40,000 to the county. I cut my own salary because I thought that because we were asking people to raise their taxes, that we ought to share some of that sacrifice. We ought to give something back to the taxpayers of the county. I'm the only one who did that. Quite frankly, I tried to get all my colleagues to do it. And so I'm all about efficiencies where we can do it. I'm all about savings. And guess what? We got rid of the pop tax. And some people said that we were going to have to lay off thousands of people. We laid off maybe 30 people at the county out of 20,000, maybe 30. Imagine that. And guess what? The chief judge's operations didn't collapse because he wound up suing the county board and the president and saying, hey, look, I need these people. I can't lay off anybody. And he didn't have to lay off anybody. But I am all about operational efficiencies. I will protect the wallet, just like it's my own wallet. And I think all of us ought to come to service uh, with that in mind, going to work every day, trying to figure out how we can make things better for the people that we represent. And that's the kind of clerk of the circuit court that I'll be, somebody who will roll up my sleeves, go to work every day, and make sure that uh, we make things happen for the people of Cook County. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So, um, The next question uh, focuses on data transparency in the clerk's office. So currently, the clerk's office is exempt from the Freedom of Information Act and can't release court data requested by journalists or researchers or members of the public without permission from the chief judge's office. Uh, What will you do to make uh, court data more readily available? Um, Candidate Martinez, we'll start with you. You know, thank you very much for that question. Um, you know, I believe the a such a change in the freedom of information uh, is needed. I'm going to work on legislation this coming uh, session to start, you know, to start that process. I really believe that that the data, the data, we have to be first of all, we got to be very careful uh, with the data. But more important, I think that there's there's also the only way we're going to be able to find out real numbers is by having the Freedom of Information um, um, Act be part of that and that we, that we should be, you know, that sh- it should be changed. Um, I really believe the transparency issue is big in, in, in the uh, clerk's office. Uh, there has been so much has been said, but I think that um, looking forward, I think we have to, again, uh, work with all the entities. We have to bring in all the different uh, parts of the clerk's office into one room. Uh, we have to talk about call, calling for an audit 
of performance in each of these entities within the uh, county clerk's office and make sure, because we have to look to see where the deficiencies are at, where the ineffectiveness is at, and really work collectively to make sure that we are taking that budget money and, and, and moving it around to where and, and, and really enact much more programs that are much more effective for the people and for the people who work there also. We have to just change the culture of that office uh, that has been long overdue based on what you know we've seen. And so I think that uh, statutorily, that, that is a, a, a way, that statutory changing the freedom of information is a way to start to start the process in, in that data collection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, candidate uh, Meister, and by the way, if you want me to repeat the question, please, I, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So let me know if you need me to repeat it. Um, no, I, I'm fine with it. Okay. <clears throat> this is actually one of the issues that I address in my transparency, the transparency portion of my plan. Um, transparency is extraordinarily important. Um, in the clerk's office. Um, I look forward to working with Senator Martinez to having legislation passed in Springfield to uh, broaden the application of FOIA to the office. Um, although there's things that the clerk's office has done and they hide behind the, uh, the, the uh, chief judge and trying to claim that they don't have to produce information when in fact the clerk should be, I will absolutely open the, the office up to FOIA requests but with a sensitivity to personal data and personal information that the clerk's office has to be sensitive to, whether it's dealing with minors, whether it's dealing with people's individual information. One of the bigger issues, and I have been very involved with it, is um, researchers and academic, uh, academics who need access to court data, raw data, so that they can conduct criminal studies, so that they can use the data that is in the court system to measure trends, whether they're economic trends, whether they're, whether they're litigation trends, um, and those are things that the clerk's office has not been cooperative with. I think it is essential, particularly with the crime rate that we have, that the clerk's office makes available data and information so that our academics are able to make decisions. The other area for transparency and data and information is financial information. Uh, the clerk's office um, needs to be held accountable for the hundreds of millions of dollars in fines, fees, and forfeitures that are going through the office. The clerk's office has refused to allow audits and auditors in. There was one audit that was done, and it found huge problems, including the fact that the clerk's office still manually reconciles many accounts on paper with with pencil and paper, and we need to have a, a better uh, general ledger system and make the information available. Okay, thank you. Um, candidate Boykin, go ahead. And again, if you need me to restate the question, I'm happy to. State the question. Yeah, so uh, the clerk's office is currently exempt from the Freedom of Information Act and uh, can't release, release data um, to members of the public or researchers or journalists without permission from the chief judge. So what will you do to make uh, court data more readily available? So two things. One, I work with the Supreme Court of Illinois, uh, and I'll work with the chief judge to make sure that um, – the data that uh, we can release to the media that doesn't uh, violate someone's private uh, rights or pri uh, rights as an individual, I'll make sure that uh, we release that data immediately. I talked about accountability and transparency and integrity. Look, that's what I bring. When I was a county commissioner, I made sure that uh, we talked about the hospital debt and selling the hospital debt. I think that's why Jay Shannon probably lost his job because uh, the debt is spiraling out of control. So what Boykin was talking about in terms of this rising debt at the hospital and ultimately the taxpayers of the county are going to be on the hook for it. Finally, a year and a half later, they say Inspector General came out with a report that said pretty much Boykin was right when he was here talking about the numbers of debt. And of course, they were fudging the numbers. I think when you have someone who's accountable to the taxpayer, someone who's going to be transparent, and someone who has the kind of integrity that I have, you will know that you'll get access to those documents. I think it's, it's good because we live in America. We live in a democratic society, and we ought to make these documents available that, in fact, can be made available. And so I'll work with the chief judge, work with the Supreme Court, 
on day one to make sure that that happens. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, candidate Kapanarji. So I would work with the Chief Justice, Chief Justice, Chief Justice Tim Evans. I'd also work with the Illinois Administrative Office of the Courts and the Illinois Supreme Court to look for non-legislative ways to lift the FOIA prohibition right now. Um, I'd have my general counsel at the clerk's office look at the legal standing and see if this is case law or if this is statute or if this is something that can be voluntarily removed. Um, the open data project that Cook County has uh, had operating for almost a decade has been an overwhelming success, but it only works if there's electronic data to put into the system. So not only is this in response to FOIAs, but the electronic, the open data process would work, again, if you had digital solutions being put in there. Uh, the reform plan that I released last fall has, th has the 10 poles of technology, transparency, and talent. Uh, the tech and they're all interconnected. How are they interconnected? Because if you digitize the court's records, and if you make them available for OCR, optical character, character recognition, and you put them into the open data project, uh, uh, sociologists and criminologists can take a look at those data and say, what's the average age of someone getting a protective order? What's their gender? What's their race? What's their background? What's their education level? How long was a protective order open for? We have a warehouse filled right now at Cicero and other warehouses throughout the county filled with data that can help working families and that can help people in Cook County but it's in paper. When, once we make that electronic, whether that's through FOIA or just voluntarily embracing technology, until we make that electronic, we can't start to have those solutions that I'm afraid are sitting in our warehouses right now and sitting in the basement of courthouses. So again, that technology and that transparency with talent, with a trained, motivated workforce, your team who wants to learn how to use technology and embrace it, Technology, transparency, and talent together can really bring transformative change to the clerk's office. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so uh, a couple of you brought up the issue of, um, of the fees, and uh, I just want to note that um, the clerk's office currently brings in more revenue through user fees uh, than any other part of county government, more than $70 million per year. So my question to the candidates is um, – Currently, the clerk's office is using private debt collection agencies to go after litigants for outstanding court costs. Uh, what is your position on this practice? Um, Candidate Boykin, we can start with you. Thank you very much. The Supreme Court recently uh, did a study on these fines and fees, and uh, some of those recommendations need to be implemented. I take the position that... Um, we need to make sure that uh, folks aren't on a, a, a spiral of debt or, go, or going on a spiral into debt as a result of a ticket that has doubled, tripled, and had fees attached to it. I mean, I think that's outrageous. And so what I would do is make sure that uh, we protect the least of these, especially those who can't afford to pay these kinds of fees uh, that are assessed uh, as a result of late uh, or being late on a payment or something like that. I, um, I'm for protecting the taxpayers, and I'm for making sure that uh, the people who come from the most marginalized communities aren't penalized, aren't nickeled and dimed uh, by red light camera tickets and other things as a result of uh, just not being able to protect themselves and not being able to access justice. Uh, in our court system, or not being able to afford a lawyer to, to argue their case for them. And so I'm the only candidate up here who grew up in Englewood, and I understand what it's like to struggle. And I'm going to make sure that those folks who uh, encounter these kinds of situations don't have to worry about those needless uh, fees. In fact, uh, you know, I'll work with folks uh, on day one to make sure that we wipe the slate clean for individuals so that, uh, you know, they don't have to worry about paying those fees. Are you saying you're going to erase the debt? That's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm going to work to erase that debt. Reporters take note. Uh, candidate Meister, um, go ahead. Thank you very much. Actually, And let me know if you need to repeat the question. If you can, you, you, yeah, so the clerk's office is currently using private debt collection agencies to go after litigants for outstanding court costs. Um, what is your position on this practice? 
Well, it's it's very interesting question because it's something I've been working with with uh, various legislators and some of the judiciary in Springfield. And I know uh, Senator Martinez has been involved with it as well. Um, debt collection is a huge problem around the county. You end up having people who are ordered to pay fines, fees and forfeitures that they simply cannot thousands of dollars. Sometimes they simply cannot afford. So one of the things there was a, a new piece of legislation that came out effective July 1st, 2019, which actually provides that individuals can get credit for uh, community service against their fines, fees, and forfeitures so that they can essentially work it off. One of the problems we're working on right now that we need to have a trailer bill through the legislature for is that the effective rate for uh, those individuals is like $4 an hour. And, you know, we need to, we need to, I've talked extensively with a number of our judges. We're going to work through that. Um, But you have to understand that the Clerk's office has about four to five hundred different statutes that govern what transpires as far as fines, fees, and forfeitures. This piece of legislation that became effective July 1st is massive. It was about a 600-page bill that attempted to go through all these statutes and adjust fines, fees, and forfeitures. You know, so the clerk's office is it really takes in all of this money, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, is responsible for remitting it to our municipalities, to our, to our, uh, the state, to the county. Everybody has a piece of the pie. Uh, we've got tremendous accounting problems. There are collection problems. We need to do a better job of making sure that people aren't trapped in a spiral of debt because of, of fines and fees. Uh, working with with Springfield, we can make that happen. Um, we also have to make sure we're doing better accounting because a lot of our municipalities are not getting the remittances they're entitled to, and that's we, we should we have to fix that problem. Okay, uh, candidate Kabanarji, let me know if you need a repeat of the question. Thanks. Would you mind repeating it? Yeah. So uh, the clerk's office is currently using private debt collection agencies to go after litigants for outstanding court costs. What is your position on this practice? Sure. We need to, first of all, eliminate the private debt collection. Second, well, of, Say that again? First of all, I think we need to move toward eliminating the private mm-hmm. debt collection. Um, the Illinois Supreme Court, as, as uh, Richard mentioned, last year issued a, a groundbreaking report where they look at fees and fines in Illinois. And one of the conclusions they came with is it's important for the public to understand the difference between a fee and a fine. A fine is punitive and relates to the punishment. Uh, when folks understand the difference between a fee and a fine, a fee, which is related to a service, becomes uh, more palatable. But again, you have to explain to people what the fee is paying for. Uh, The clerk of the court over the past 20 years has moved to having a large number of what are called special purpose funds, funds that are under her discretion. She has uh, at least four special purpose funds that we've identified right now, automation, digitization, modernization. Um, A a fee such as that, which is related to the fine, which is related to the filing of a civil action, makes it so that it's, it's almost $300 in Cook County to get your case heard. So when you're talking about opening up the people's courthouses and giving them access to justice, it costs you $300 before you can even move in there. So at the Board of Review, and then again when I was at the SEC, we would see that fees for filing, for example, the federal government has PACER, uh, you pay per page. I would take a look at, at sunsetting many of these filing fees to see that they're connected to the service. And once the service is provided, you can quit collecting that fee. So again, once we've digitized, we no longer need the, digitiz- the size of the digitization fee. Once we've automated, we can wind down an automation fee. And I think when you explain to the folks who use the courts what their fee is going for and that there is a sunset provision and a timeline when they will no longer be paying it, they'll see the purpose of the fee. As to fines, I fully support Mayor Lightfoot's initiative to uh, critically look at every single fine that has come uh, come online and to at every opportunity eliminate punitive fines. Uh, Nobody wants to be in court. Not, not the litigants, not the lawyers, nobody. But that's where you have to go to get your justice. We should not charge you $300 to go into court to get your justice. Okay, thank you so much. And candidate Martinez. Thank you very much. Um, you know, one of the first things I would do, and I, and I, and I want to make sure that we also look at all these vendors, and, and in this particular case, the private debt collection, I mean, I, I would like to know how much they're getting paid 
uh, for collecting this debt, you know, and sometimes it might even be more than what's really old out there. So I, I think it's important that we start that process right away, making sure. But, you know, I, you, I, I hear so many constituents that come to my office about the fees and the fines and, and trying to understand uh, what the difference between both of them. And I think, you know, you hit it right on the money when you said that we have to actually define that. I, I, again, that's why I said that I think online payments for costs is going to be very important. I think that eliminates this private debt collection for going out there and collecting this money. When people are willing to pay online, every, everything right now is everything online. So I think this is a way for us to also start looking. And and the fees, I know that uh, uh, Jacob mentioned what we've been doing in Springfield and the bill that was signed. You know, and, and even there was a lot of reduction of these fees. But you're right, that $4 an hour is really, it doesn't take anybody out of debt. You know, we have to lift these these folks out of that. And I think a $10 uh, fee, I mean, a $10 uh, an hour probably works better minimum than a $4 wage. Minimum, wage. My, a minimum wage. I mean, but that's, yeah, that will, hopefully we can get to there. But I, I just think that uh, there are too many people in debt today and, 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 and trying, and especially if you are working, if you're a working family, working mom, a single mom, uh, you know, an individual out there, low income person, with these debt, they're never going to get out. There's no way that they can do that when we keep adding these fees and these fees keep growing. So I really believe that that's, that's an attention that we need to make sure we address right away. We have to go in and, 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 and find out how we can make sure that people understand the difference, but at the same time as find a way to collect that money, but also look at these individuals and what their, what, what, you know, financial uh, burden they have on them and try to help them uh, you know, get to a good point where they can pay, even if it's on a payment plan. I mean, we have to find ways just to make sure that we address those constituents that are coming in there with those. Things. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, candidates, how would you approach the relationship um, with the unionized workforce of the office in such a way that honors the clerk's role in providing steady, decently paid work to a lot of county residents? while also improving the professional standards um, of, the, of the staff. So please be specific. Um, candidate Meister, we'll start with you. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I come from a labor background myself, and this is an office that is a, a, a Teamsters office. Teamsters 700 represents the union. I ac actually, uh, prior to going to law school, drove a truck for Teamsters. So I'm very sensitive to the labor issues in the office. The morale in the office right now is tremendously low. And these are people I've worked with. I know a lot of the clerk staff just from working in the courts for the last 29 years. Many of them are friends and supporters of mine. I know all too well that the, the morale in the office needs to be improved. Uh, a lot of the, the, the folks in the, in the clerk's office sincerely want this office to operate efficiently, transparently. They know uh, there's problems with technology and that we need to modernize our technology absolutely. Um, thank you, I guess. Yeah, yeah so... Um, you know, I want to make sure that we are respecting the, the people who work in the office. Training stopped in about 2004 of employees in the clerk's office, and that is unacceptable. So we're putting we're we're taking we're moving from a paper based system to an electronic system, but we're not and, and putting in place very complicated, sophisticated computer systems and requ that require much more than moving a paper. Now, uh, the clerk staff needs to be able to record digitally orders in real time, minute orders, and we cannot modernize this office without training. I have a whole program you'll see in my plan to um, work with the city colleges and the, uh, the, the university system to have uh, paralegal certificates in Cook County court, court management and be able to give uh, uh, training, particular to, particularly to our courtroom personnel, who need to be able to be trained in how our system, the new systems work so that the systems actually end up working as opposed to, to going by the wayside. Okay, thank you. Um, candidate Martinez, go ahead. Uh, first and foremost, I, I will always respect the union contracts. Uh, union workers are you know, excellent individu uh, individuals who really work hard and are, are very proud 
to work in these uh, in, in in the clerk's office. I've met a few of the workers that are there, and you know, again, uh, uh, working with them uh, is going to be important. Sitting down with the with the union itself when it comes to renegotiating contracts and everything. I've had that experience before. I used to work for the city of Chicago before I became a senator. I, I deal with all the different labor uh, uh, components down in Springfield about the you know the working class. Uh, families that they uh, that are union members, and so you know we have to we have to make sure that uh, they are they, that the union workers are properly trained. I really believe that there really needs to be we have to implement a new training system there. Uh, I really believe under new leadership, it is going to be necessary for us to really um, uh, get them to uh, really to the to a, a place where we can say that the clerk's office is finally functioning the way it should be. Um, we have to make sure that um, as the negotiation go 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 on that the workers are getting uh, you know the the, the, the benefits uh, that they deserve uh, but at the same time making sure that the productivity is there and that we can continue to even hire more individuals because that office I think that one time we look at how when an audit when an audit is performed at that uh, at that in that in the clerk's office we're going to see where the deficiencies are at, and where we can remove we can move people around. But more important is that we can bring in more people because there's a shortage. And you know, when you talk about 2,000 employees, we have to make sure that those 2,000 employees are, are being you know are, are effective. But more important that our courtrooms are have the very best in the in 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 the courtrooms, uh, and making sure that we at the end of the day that the union is uh, is a part of what they want to see uh, for their members uh, in the in that office. Okay, thank you. Um, candidate Kabanarji. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, so uh, the, um, how would you approach the relationship with the unionized workforce in such a way that honors the clerk's role in providing steady, decent uh, work to a lot of county residents uh, while also improving the professional standards of the staff? I've spent my whole career working and fighting for uh, working families. Um, when I was working for Senator Simon, when I was working for Senator Durbin, when I was a federal prosecutor, um, in fact, when I was a federal prosecutor, for those of you who are lawyers, I was a dues paying member of National Treasury Employees Union Local 293. I was a, a, a member of a union. NTU covers lawyers. So for those folks who wonders, can lawyers unionize? Yeah. NTU Local 293. Ask about it. Um, I bring something here that nobody else has, which is I've actually led uh, a Cook County office. I've led a Cook County workforce. I've had to build a team. And specific to this office, I've had to work with a team and lead them as they move from a paper-based system to digital solutions. As we built out our system, uh, our digital appeals processing system at the Board of Review, uh, one of the things that we learned early on is as you build the system, your employees have to drive the system. You have to work with them to see how they want to use technology and how they can do their jobs with technology. Um, it's very important to remember uh, that, it, and, and we talk about this in my reform, my reform plan, that it's the technology transparent and the transparency and the talent. You have to work with your employees. You have to train them and have them embrace it. The new clerk, uh, when he or she comes in, is going to have a collective bargaining agreement that ends November 30th. Okay, so the Teamster 700 contract expires November 30th. You're going to have to be ready on day one to work with Teamster 700 under the CBA and deliver. On top of that, as an overlay, you also have a compliance monitor. Right? At the SEC, I hired and retained and trained compliance monitors. So I've got firsthand experience working with monitors. So you've got to partner with the Teamsters, and you also have to sit down with the monitor in the office and get a plan on day one to get the monitor out. Okay. On my first day as clerk, I would bring in the Civic Consulting Alliance, and we would do a forensic investigation of the office from top down in partnership with our employees to identify fraud and mismanagement, business operations to move the office forward. Okay, thank you. And candidate Boykin. Please repeat the question. Yeah, so how will you ap approach the relationship with the unionized workforce um, in such a way that honors the clerk's role in providing um, good, steady jobs to a lot of county residents uh, while also improving the professional standards of the staff? So the question is, how will we work with the union, uh, Teamsters Local 700, and improve, improve the employees uh, at the office? Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, I spent my time on the county board four years of voting, voting on CBAs for all of the uh, uh, county installations, county offices, 
including the uh, folks at the Board of Review, voted on their budgets and stuff. And so I have a great relationship with Teamsters Local 700, a great relationship with all of the labor unions at the county. And uh, I don't expect that that will be uh, different. In fact, I've been known over time as a bridge builder, someone who brings people together. And nobody fights harder for the workforce and for working class families than I do as a result of coming from a family where my father worked for 33 years at Ford Motor Company, a member of the UAW. And so I understand what it's like to be uh, in a family with uh, someone in a labor union. When I was a teacher, uh, I was a substitute, full-time substitute teacher for CPS. I actually had to pay union dues as a full-time substitute teacher. Imagine that. So I understood what it was like, but I think the unions are there to protect employees' rights, and we want to make sure that those rights are protected. We'll do everything that we can to make sure that we have, and I said this earlier, a motivated, well-trained workforce because the county deserves no less. Every taxpayer in the county deserves to have someone, when you come into that clerk's office, because the clerk's office has the ability to either have you win a case or lose a case. Uh, they can take away your freedom by not uh, uh, being able to uh, treat you properly when you come through that office. And so we're going to make sure that we work with the labor unions in a real way, especially with the Teamsters. Uh, and I expect that we'll have a great relationship on day one. Okay. Uh, it's interesting that all of you interpreted that question as asking you to state your positions on the union um, and haven't said anything about the patronage in the office. So the office is, there's multiple uh, members in that office who are under investigation or indictment for job selling, for there's all kinds of patronage scandals that have plagued the office for years. Um, so uh, how, 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 do you, how are you going to untangle that issue while some of the people who may be in these union jobs are also patronage hires? So, Candidate Martinez, can you talk about that? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, yes. I, from day one, I will, I will visit every courtroom. I will visit with every employee uh, that I can possibly meet with, if not the first day, uh, the rest of the week. But I, I got to say, I want, I want people to tell me why they have that job and why they should keep it. I, I plan to interview uh, many of the employees that are there, especially the ones that have been, you know, uh, singled out as patronage jobs. We have a lot of those there. We've heard that, you know, and I am not going to comment on, on as far as what, you know, was done in the past. I can't tell you right now that my, on, the, on my first day, I, I want to end patronage jobs. Anyone there that is there that cannot really explain to me or tell me why they should have that job and why they need to keep it uh, will definitely uh, be looked at as someone that we will make sure that we put on the side and, and look at all the other employees that are basically there, not because they were connected, but because they actually got their job on their own. I think that's important that we meet. And especially when you look at all the the, the, the people surrounding the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the administration itself, I want to know what your job is and why is it that if the county clerk's office is such in a bad shape, full of mismanagement and corruption, what were these individuals around uh, the, uh, the clerk's office doing to improve those conditions? All we kept hearing year after year is that. So for me, uh, making sure that that, especially the main office of where I think many of those jobs, those patronage lie, they're going to have to explain to me who they are, where they come from, and why they should keep their job. Okay, thank you. Candidate Boykin. Well, thank you very much. Uh, look, there are those who talk about what they'll do. I'll tell you what I've done. I actually, when I worked for the county, we didn't have any patronage political hiring. And wherever I saw it, I tried to do something about it. And so the real deal is that we're going to make sure uh, that on day one that we put forward a plan to get us from under Shackman, which is costing taxpayers millions of dollars. We can save that money. But, of course, you got to have somebody with integrity. you got to have somebody who has a vision and has a plan to actually follow through on these things. I'll make sure that there is no pay to play. I mean, uh, one of the things that I did today is I actually, well, I did it a couple of days ago. I had my staff make sure that uh, we hadn't received any contributions from clerks, current clerk employees. 
And uh, we noticed that we have received three contributions from employees who are current employees at the clerk's office. So we sent those uh, contributions back with a nice letter that said, hey, look, I welcome your support. Please vote for me. But uh, we can't accept contributions from clerk's employees. In fact, that's not the way we operate. I won't do it when I'm the clerk. Uh, and you won't have to worry about those sorts of things. Just worry about doing your job to the best of your ability and making sure that we service the people who are coming through those doors. Because, again, we want to make sure that everybody has access to justice. We want to make sure that they have access to the courtrooms and that sort of thing. And so the answer is no patronage under a Boykin administration. I will not tolerate it. All right. Uh, candidate Kabanarji. The, the clerk of the court's office has been plagued with scandals, investigations, and convictions for too long. Uh, can you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I vote WBZ. You just heard that one way too loud. Um, I was going to say again, the clerk of the court's office has been plagued with scandals, investigations, and convictions for too long. Public trust and confidence in their justice system is critical if this is going to work. And the, the clerk of the court's office is a key part of that system. Um, as a former federal prosecutor, I spent my career at the SEC rooting out and investigating and prosecuting fraud and corruption. I've seen uh, successful compliance systems that the clerk of the court's office can work. I know that some of the first hires that I would make would be a general counsel, an HR director, and a new inspector general who will really make it their commitment to identify fraud and waste and mismanagement. Um, when I was uh, first appointed to the border as a commissioner of the border review, I drafted our first ethics policy. Um, that ethics policy is shared with all the employees. Employees go through annual training. Um, it's been said here before, there's a lot of talent in the clerk's office. As I mentioned before, too, I would have the Civic Consulting Alliance come in early on. We've partnered with them at Cook County before uh, on, on successful programs. CCA is made up, if you don't know of it or not familiar with it, uh, of leading consultants who uh, volunteer their time to the county for large projects. CCA can come in and, I, and work with us on business operations and planning and also job descriptions that empower our employees clear job descriptions. And again, you have to do this in partnership with the Teamsters. You have to do this in partnership with the monitor. But once employees are empowered to know what their job duties are, they have the right to tell their boss, that's not part of my job. If their supervisor wants them to cross a the line, they know that's not part of their job. And with a new inspector general and a new general counsel, they'll know who they can go to to get those bad actors out of the office. Thank you. And candidate Meister? Yeah, um, thank you. I mean, I have made as part of my, my plan as part of my plan under transparency, I've got an ethics statement. Um, when I was asked the first question today, the question was, what's the most important thing to accomplish in the office? And I said, getting rid of patronage and ending our pay-to-play culture. It is the, the most important thing. We have entrenched party interests who are deep uh, into the jobs in the clerk's office. It's known. Everybody knows it. And those political interests are part of what end up keeping this office broken. And one thing I need to to uh, point out and call out one of my opponents, uh, Mike Caminardi, is he, the Board of Review is the only unit of government in Cook County that does not have a union. It is 100 percent patronage. Um, you see you see a, a tremendous number of precinct captains who are employed there. You have about 20% of the petitions that were circulated for ballot access collected from employees in that office. Um, it is an entrenched office that's entrenched in patronage, and I suspect that has something to do with why the party has slated Mr. Cabernardi for this position, because they want to hold on to the, off the jobs in the office, which are a source of power. I will not tolerate it. The office has to function in the taxpayer's best interest to make sure that the people's work is getting done, not the work of the entrenched political interests. Uh, thank you. So 
since this is a forum and not a debate, uh, we're, one second. So we'll make an exception in this case, uh, just candidates going forward, please refrain from attacking your opponents. But given that that wasn't clearly stated in the beginning, uh, we'll allow it. So uh, we'll give you one minute to respond. Um, go ahead, candidate Kobanerji. I'm very proud of the work we do at the Border Review along with my, oh, sorry. <laughs> Make sure I got the right mic again here. Thank you. WBZ again, folks. Um, I'm very proud of the work we do at the Board of Review, and I'm very proud of the team we've built. Um, I make it very clear to them. They're free to join whatever union. Ask me, SEIU, whatever labor union they want to join. Uh, I would never stand in the way as management of my employees choosing the, choosing the labor union that they want to organize around. They've just chosen not to join a union. If they want to be unionized, they're certainly welcome to do so. Uh, welcome that at any time. Um, when I came in from the SEC, I saw that there were operational changes we needed. We needed an ethics officer. We need an ethics policy. We've embraced that. Um, I'm proud to have the support of a wide variety of progressive leaders, Jan Schakowsky, Kelly Cassidy, Brandon Johnson, Dick Durbin, um, folks who I've worked with and have seen firsthand the progressive transformative change I can bring when given an opportunity. Um, again, I'd rather talk about the issues here that we're talk, uh, here to talk about uh, rather than the politics of it all, uh, but I'm very proud of the support I've got, um, and I think it's based upon a track record of public service in my life as a prosecutor and someone who spent 25 years uh, helping the people of Cook County. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, next question is, how will you improve the chaotic electronic filing system currently in place, um, especially for pro se litigants and those dealing with domestic violence cases? Um, Candidate Boykin, you could start. Well, thank you very much. So electronic uh, filing is the law of the land as a result of the Supreme Court. And uh, it's something that we must improve, uh, especially on the civil side. It's the law of the land. But in criminal cases, uh, they're still filing with paper. And so we got to make sure that, uh, one, we, 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 we improve the fact that we need to file electronically on the criminal side and on the traffic side of things. So those are some specific things that I would do. But what I would do is leverage our resources uh, in the community. Uh, there are a lot of legal aid uh, societies, a lot of legal aid groups uh, who can provide uh, assistance to pro se litigants uh, and help them access justice. This is the real critical access to justice moment where a person needs to be able to file a case to, to, to get in the court. And so clerks employees oftentimes aren't lawyers, and so they can't provide legal advice. But you know, if we leverage our resources in the legal community because they're looking for pro bono hours anyhow. And so I would leverage resources that are already in existence uh, and, and have those individuals have hours uh, at the uh, Daily Center and some of our other uh, circuit court buildings. We'd make space available for them there and actually uh, give them an opportunity. We provide coffee, too, and donuts, whatever. Uh, but we make the, the process so easy for them. And we make sure that uh, they're actually helping these pro se litigants because we're having more and more pro se litigants. And that's self-represented individuals uh, in our court system. And so I want to make sure that they're taken care of. And I'd also make sure that uh, those individuals who have uh, who, who don't speak English, that we have individuals who can service them as well and that they don't have to wait around for two and three hours just to get serviced. That That's my answer. Thank you. Uh, candidate Martinez. Yeah. Uh, so how will you improve the chaotic electronic filing system that's currently in place, um, especially for pro se litigants and those dealing with domestic violence cases? Well, thank you. Um, I, as you know, that there has been such a big issue with the um, electronic, you know, um, uh, the electronics uh, component of the clerk's office. And I really believe, um, you know, one of the things that I, I first want to do is, is we, you know, we, we keep talking about the technology and the problem. We have to, we have to hold that, uh, that vendor accountable to what's going on with the, the technology and how this, how this component is really uh, uh, giving set, setbacks for folks that are trying to get this information. I know that many of the lawyers that I talked to in the past have said, you know, trying to get the case you know, the case file has been a hard, you know, hardship because of the fact that not all the information is there and they can't proceed with that information. There is a, a, a lot of work that needs to be done in that office as far as the technology and how that information is gathered and, and how do we make it in a very quick, turn around in a quick fashion. I think there's, again, 
the technology component of that has to be actually, we have to talk to this vendor, uh, all these vendors that are there that have, have provided these, these, this, 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 this service to the clerk, but somehow it hasn't been, it's been, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, faulty, you know, uh, uh, parts that have not been able to, that we've caused delays in people actually getting the service they need. I really believe that we need a, a, a whole look, a whole, we need to have real, uh, uh, a gathering of just all of what's wrong there uh, on day one and start. Uh, we cannot keep delaying people's lives, people's, you know, uh, staying, staying in jail uh, for, for time, for limited time because their paperwork has not been completed. I really believe that we really, there's a lot of work to be done, and I think that technologists, that whoever the, 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 the IT person that has been involved needs to really sit down and really have a real heart-to-heart with the vendor and find out why and what, how much money has been paid, but why is it that there are so many flaws in the system itself? Okay, thank you, candidate um, Kabanarji. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, what, how will you improve the chaotic electronic filing system currently in place, um, especially for pro se litigants and those with domestic violence cases? So um, the company that um, we've been talking about is called Tyler Technology. Uh, it's a publicly traded company right now. Uh, we're unfortunately familiar with them on the and the property tax side of the world because they are uh, years behind in building out a system for the assessor and the treasurer. Uh, they also have a contract with the clerk of the court's office. They've repeatedly blown deadlines and are over budget on helping the county develop uh, a, a document management system. Um, when the Illinois Supreme Court required electronic filing, it contracted with Tyler to build out a system called Odyssey. Uh, meanwhile, the clerk's office is using the, clerk, the Tyler uh, contract separately to create a document management system. As I understand it, that contract expires in June. I would not renew the contract with Tyler. I would put that out again for public procurement and look for other vendors and bids. Um, Tyler is not the only vendor in this space. There are other folks that can build a system. Uh, there are other folks that want to work with us. Specific to your question, though, about pro se and domestic violence, um, you know, I've, I've talked to a number of current and former judges as we built out my reform plan uh, and before we released it. And I heard a lot of disturbing um, stories, especially from those who, who work with uh, victims of domestic violence. And it's uh, and, and we've talked about it, the, the, the marginalized, the, the seniors, those who English isn't their first or any language, the disabled, they need special protections and special services provided to them. And when you look at folks with domestic violence, uh, they need special clerks. They need special in-court clerks who have received special training. So I would specially train uh, those clerks who work in family court and domestic violence court. I would specially train those in-court clerks who work with the pro se community. Not all clerks are going to receive the same training because not all clerks deal with the same community. So, again, that's something I've seen at the Board of Review, and, and that's something that I would bring over is specialized training for specialized clerks. Thank you. Thank you. And candidate Meister. Thank you. Um, once again, this is an area that I go into uh, very in depth in my modernization uh, policy. Um, the Tyler system, I think people have a fundamental misunderstanding of what electronic filing is. As a matter of fact, I spent my morning on the, the court system's electronic filing system. Um, the electronic filing is just the first step in modernization, and it's just how do you file papers into the system? It's basically a sophisticated fax machine. Instead of going filing paper, you send it in in PDF form, and the court stamps it. The most important part is what comes in the un unfolding of the next step. So you have to take that electronically filed PDF information and incorporate it into what's known as a case management system. And the case management system is where all those electronic files are stored. We've heard about the PACER system, which is the federal system, which is a very old system. Uh, it, it's effective and it works. There's much more modern systems that we need to incorporate, but it's the way we need to have clerks who are able to uh, digitize orders as opposed to us continuing to have to hand write them out by the millions every year in triplicate with, with carbon paper. Um, that's, it's, it's, it's a unfolding, it's various steps to the automation process. Pro se litigants, you asked about, are really hurt by the electronic filing system because they used to be able to mail it in. You now are, man, it's mandatory that you have to file on paper are electronically and somebody who doesn't have internet who doesn't who can't navigate the very complex filing system 
they are really at problems. Now they have to travel down to the court location during business hours in order to get assistance. I want to unfold that in every public library around the county so that the our libraries become points of access, have regular training for librarians so that people can go in and say on a Saturday and say, I need to file something. Can you help me do it? And it's in their own neighborhood on weekends and evenings. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so one more question for me, and then uh, we'll take a few of these audience questions. So one of the jobs of the clerk's office is to provide original trial records to pro se litigants um, seeking appeals and to attorneys representing convicted individuals uh, in appeals. Uh, though these records are supposed to be provided within 60 day, 63 days of the request, it routinely takes the office months or even years to process these require, requests. Um, about 50% of the records that do ultimately get provided are incomplete. Uh, so um, w which this affects people's ability to appeal criminal convictions. Uh, why do you think uh, this is the state of affairs and how would you propose to tackle this problem? Um, candidate Meister, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, this is a this is a major source of problem for us, for those of us who regularly practice in the courts. Um, you know, I myself have had appeals. I had one not long ago. It was a 13 year old case. We had about 10 boxes of filings. And when we have filed our appeal, um, the, the clerk's office is supposed to transmit the entire case file to the appellate court so that they can render a decision. My 10 boxes of files turned up a record about this big that went to the appellate court. So it took us weeks and weeks and months to reconstruct the record on appeal. That is not satisfactory. That was for a civil case. The biggest problem are prisoners sit, who are sitting in Department of Corrections in prison who have, they may have bad convictions, bad sentences that can get overturned. And there, at one point, there were 600 prisoner appeals that couldn't move forward for more than a year because the clerk's office had couldn't find the, the record on appeal. That is unacceptable. That was reported in the reader, I believe. Um, and it's something that we're all too familiar with for those of us practicing in the courts. But if you are a prisoner sitting in Department of Corrections and your appeal can't go forward, that is the most tragic thing that our society can do to somebody. Um, and so we need to, in the digitizing process, make sure that we are keeping electronic records. The electronic record system, if everything's getting tagged right in case management systems, this should not be a problem over time. In the immediate, we need, we have, I, I personally know that in our record center out in Cicero, I've been to, the, been there many times, they've got skids of paper that's marked loose paper. And it'll say loose paper, June 2017. And that's where those prisoner appeal papers are filed. And as a matter of fact, the current clerk has prohibited any photography in that warehouse for that reason. Thank you. Uh, Candidate Boykin. Yeah, this is the quintessential access to justice issue. I talked earlier about the fact that the clerk's office can determine uh, one's freedom and whether or not one wins a case or loses a case, this is it. This is the ball game. Let me tell you, when I become the clerk, we're going to make sure that we have the e-record as the official record of the court, uh, and we're going to make sure that that record is uh, sent to the cloud and that uh, we we have, uh, you know, great record keeping in terms of uh, managing those records uh, for the taxpayers of Cook County. I think that uh, it is just so vitally important that uh, people who are either in Cook County jail and their record comes up missing and they're trying to bond them out of court or bond them out of the jail and, and you can't find the court record or so the person has to spend a couple extra hours in the county jail. I mean, I've had folks tell me about that. I mean, that will not happen under our administration. We're going to make sure that, uh, that, that we have the records, that we keep the records, that we digitize the records, um, and we're going to make sure that uh, we're accountable. I mean, this comes back to accountability. 
I mean, we got to be accountable to the taxpayers of Cook County, and that is what I'm going to do on day one. We're going to have accountability, integrity, and we're going to have transparency, and we're going to make sure that we have that motivated and trained workforce that is looking out for the taxpayers of Cook County. It could be their mother or their father or their brother or their cousin that needs that record for an appeal. So we're going to make sure that we treat every person in that manner with dignity, with integrity, and with the respect that they deserve, no matter whether they come from the North Shore or whether they come from the South Side of Chicago. We're going to make sure that everybody's treated fairly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Candidate Martinez. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we've been talking about, um, and we all, we all know, we've identified that the, the, that the office definitely has had uh, over 20 years of mismanagement, uh, and today we're seeing more and more of what's wrong. Um, I want to be able to uh, work with individuals in this room that can identify exactly what is going on there that we can actually find solutions to. Uh, yes, we have to digitize. There's no, there is no doubt that the modernization of that office is going to be very, very important in order for us to really uh, jumpstart what needs to be done. Uh, it is unacceptable that uh, people are sitting in, in jail waiting because their their records got lost. Uh, that is a, a, a family, uh, um, you know, someone that is providing, you know, a, a support for their family. It could be any individual. And basically, when you look at the system that has been so corrupt, so mismanaged, um, we need to we need to take a seat at a table with everyone that has had issues, and let's talk about these issues. Let's let's find ways. Let's find ways that we can correct these issues or find solutions. We cannot continue to say it's a mess, it's a mess, it's a mess. We have to actually take unit by unit, department by department in that clerk's office and really, really call for an audit and really look at what's wrong. But more important, when it comes to these appeals and the and the and the file, the files that are missing, that's why digitizing everything, every everything, and especially and I think that starts at the point of entry into our judicial system and that is the front line of the clerk's office. We have to make sure that right then and there the paperwork that starts to be filed there has to be carefully, you know, followed. There's got to be a lot of follow up. And I think the retraining and the restructuring of that office and, and really digitizing everything from day one, I think it's going to lead us. It's going to take, you know, we hopefully, it won't take years to fix. I think, you know, we have to really make this a priority because people's lives oh, you, are... your time's up. Thank you. Uh, and candidate Cabanardi, go ahead. Would you mind repeating the question? Yeah, so uh, the clerk's office handles records um, that for for cases that have already run their course and has to provide them to uh, folks who are appealing or pursuing post-conviction uh, proceedings of any sort. Um, it regularly takes uh, w months or even years to get those records to pro se litigants or to their attorneys. Um, half of the records come incomplete. Uh, so what do you think, why do you think this is the state of affairs and how would you propose to tackle this problem? Right. This is, I'm very glad you asked the question this way because I want to make sure I answer it correctly because we've been talking a lot about technology, e-everything, digital systems, Odyssey, Tyler, this is what, this is how it all plays out. It plays out like somebody like Gerald Reed. Um, Gerald Reed was tortured by John Burge and to giving a false confection, a confession. Uh, Gerald Reed is currently serving 30 years of a false sentence. Um, Gerald Reed is appearing before Tom, uh, Judge uh, Tom Henley. Um, and there's a special prosecutor looking if Mr. Reed should be uh, retried. Mr. Reed has been in jail for a year now after his confession was withdrawn. Judge Tom Henley had a hearing last week and stated on the record that he has been waiting for all of 2019 to get the complete trial court record. Now, if you're Mr. Reed and you were tortured as a young man and you're serving time in jail for a crime that you didn't commit, how would that make you feel that the clerk of the court's office can't get its act together and provide paperwork for you? I don't know if Mr. Reed will be uh, tried again. I don't know if he committed the crime, but he doesn't have access to his courtroom. He doesn't have access to justice because the clerk of the court's office can't get paperwork together. And he spent all of 2019 in jail. Whether or not you're an attorney, if you're a human being, that should disgust you and that should piss you off. So as clerk of the court on day one, I've got a big day ahead of me. I will pull my team aside and say, go through the over 600 files 
of, of, of trial court requests from the state appellate defender to put together the trial court record so the state appellate defender can bring inmates into court for their appeal. Every year, and the reader wrote a great article about it, the state appellate defender sends a list to the chief judge of cases that it cannot get a complete trial court record together to bring an appeal before uh, inmates that it's been appointed as counsel for. It sends this to the chief judge. Why does it send it to the chief? Because the clerk of the court ignores it. So your, your time is up. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's go f- with a couple of these audience questions. Thank you, everybody, who sent up a card. So... Um, Regarding electronic court records, uh, what is a higher priority to you? So what is a higher priority? You cannot say you want to do both of these things. So option one, providing the public access to court filings going forward. Option two, digitizing existing records for data usage, even if it's not immediately publicly accessible. Either or. Okay. (laughs) Uh, candidate Martinez, we'll start with you. <laughs> sure, it's a non-lawyer first, right? <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, I would say digitizing. I think, I think we need to start that process. There's too much paperwork that gets lost. I think that when you digitize, when you go in and start the process, I think the less chances of you, uh, uh, of, of things getting lost are, are less. And I really believe that that is the way to go. It, we have to, two minutes for this or not? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, pe- brevity is also nice. So if you, I'm good. Okay. Uh, uh, Candidate Kabanarji, uh, and let me know if you need to hear the options again. I mean, it's, I'm not going to use two minutes either. Um, I know the options are public access or digitizing records, correct? Uh, yes. When I used to work for Paul Simon, he used to have a joke. He said, I've got friends who are for that issue, and I've got friends who are against that issue, and I always stand by my friends. Um, uh, in this case, I want to say uh, digitizing records. Uh, I want to say digitizing records. I, I, uh, I you know, I, I hope that's a false choice that you don't have to choose between the two. Uh, but I think um, we can always work day in and day out on public access. But digitizing records is something, again, we've talked about it up here. We're not starting from scratch. There are other federal and local jurisdictions that we can look at and get, make enormous strides early on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Candidate Boykin? Well, I want to share with my two colleagues that digitizing has already taken place. So I will say public access because I think <laughs> in order to have the public trust the work that we're doing, we got to provide the documents to them. We got to make sure that they have access to documents. Digitizing already taking place. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, and candidate Meister. I I, uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Boykin. Um, providing public access to existing files is essential. We've been electronically capturing uh, filings for uh, five or six years. Uh, it's more than that, even. Uh, Showing my age, it's probably since 2011 um, that there's been electronic filing and and digitizing of current case files. So that means we open up access immediately to those current case files. That's going to mean lawyers and litigants and judges and everybody else has access to the the electronic filings that are already there. That is going to be a huge cost savings and a great efficiency for those who practice in the courts, who need access to existing files. Not saying digitizing, the old stuff shouldn't happen so that we can shut down warehouses and move everything electronic, but it tends to be the older files that are not digitized currently that can happen in due course. Uh, Like I said, though, in order to to access those existing files, we need to have a robust case management system and that's what we don't have right now. So we've got to move on, on implementing the case management system. There have been tremendous problems rolling it out in the, in the criminal system. We have to work very hard to make sure that the case management system is customized, that meets the needs of e- and workflow of every courtroom. But basically, let's move forward on making that public access to existing files available. We can then work on the backlog of those old cases that need to be digitized so that we can have complete records uh, on those cases. Okay, thank you. Next question is, um, a relatively large percentage of court cases involve orders of protection and civil no-contact orders. 
How familiar are you with the clerk's role in ensuring those orders are enforceable? And where do you think there's room for improvement? Candidate Governor G. Sure. Um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with the sheriff's staff about how they're serving orders um, and ways to improve them. Not surprisingly, some of it involves technology, but a lot of it involves cooperation uh, between the clerk of the court's office and the sheriff's office uh, to better um, serve orders and to make sure that the orders are enforced. Um, so I would start on uh, with an early conversation with the sheriff's office about how they're serving these orders of protection. And again, it goes back to digitizing records. Um, once it's in a digital format, and once that order is electronic, that person who has that order of protection has it on their phone. That person, their family members have it on their phone. Uh, everyone around them has it on their phone. Um, so in, an, in, a, uh, in a digital world right now, an order of protection is something that's uh, around you at all times and protecting you at all times. Okay, thank you. Uh, candidate Boykin. This is a true question really about whether or not we're going to victimize a person twice. And so we got to make sure that, uh, that we have a fully trained clerk staff that's going to make sure that they get those orders in the system and make sure that we communicate with the sheriff's office. Let me tell you, I, I, I had someone share with me an example uh, similar to this where an individual was on an electronic monitor uh, there was a certain date that the electronic monitor was supposed to be, you know, taken off. Well, the clerk's office, they know when because they put the paperwork in the system. And so, you know, the person's attorney had to actually call the sheriff and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, the uh, the electronic monitor is supposed to have been off this guy. And so the sheriff's office contacted the clerk's office and they said, yes, that's right. It's supposed to be off. And so, you know, the guy had the monitor on for a few days longer than what he should have. Uh, we don't want to make sure we don't want to make that happen. We want to make sure that, uh, that 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 we're careful about the work that we do and that we do it to the best of our ability, that we're motivated about it, that we're doing it as if, you know, our mother is on, on the line or if we're doing it for our mother. And we may not know the person, but we treat them as if they're our, they're our mother and all of us love our mother. Uh, that may be my mom calling, <laughs> but, uh, Take the call. but, <laughs> but that's what I would do. I would make sure that uh, we have the lines of communication open with the sheriff and, you know, with the law enforcement community and make sure that uh, we have a well-trained staff, especially when it comes to issues, uh, of orders of protection. Okay. Thank you. Um, Candidate Meister, and again, the question is, how familiar are you with the clerk's role in ensuring that orders of protection and civil no contact orders are enforceable, and where do you think there's room for improvement? Go ahead. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because orders of protection are the one area I've talked earlier about mandatory electronic filing. Orders of protection are the one thing that are exempt from a mandatory electronic filing, and that's a very good thing because as cumbersome of a filing system as we have, we need to give immediate access to justice for orders of protection. And that means somebody can walk in and fill out a piece of paper and it doesn't have to be electronically filed. And that's a good thing. The clerk's handling of that paperwork after it's done is where a lot of the problem is transmitting it to where it needs to be. The clerk has never been particularly good at that. Uh, one thing we have to move towards, and it's in my plan for modernization under integration of technology, is we have to have what's known as a uh, integrated justice information system. It's a, it's a system that uh, the state of Wisconsin has, uh, Minnesota, a lot of other jurisdictions, and what it basically says is you have to have an electronic platform that is that talks to every constituency that needs a court. So whether it's the sheriff's department, whether it's the Department of Corrections, uh, the state's attorney, public defender, private lawyers, they all have pieces and, and an interest in the system, and it's communicating where it needs to communicate. We have to be able to walk before we can run, but I see that where the clerk's office needs to move is towards an integrated justice platform so that there's a seamless transaction. The sheriff's department, but for the in the in the meantime, the clerk's office has to make sure that it's doing a better job communicating orders with the sheriff's department. There is difficulty between the two computer systems talking to each other, um, and that's been a problem throughout the Cook County system. Um, so if, if it needs to be 
done by hand and hand walk down. That's what needs to happen. But ultimately, the computer systems need to talk to each other. And when we start running, we'll have an integrated justice system. Okay, thank you so much. And candidate Martinez. You know, when you talk about order protection or the civil no contact order, you know, you're talking about a person's life that, you know, hangs right there. And, um, you know, when you have to access the the office of the clerk, um, you know, that's why I say from day one, you know, meeting with every other part of uh, the uh, the county uh, offices, like the public defender, like the city attorney's office, like the sheriff's office, we have to really make contact with them. And we have to assure that there is definitely a real, right now there's a wide gap. And I think that that's been uh, the, 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 the problems in the past. I, when I, you know, when I hear women come into my office and say they have filed for order protection, you know, and, and, and it didn't happen right away, you know, uh, you hear these stories. And so the sheriff's office has to be like the, non the number one office to work with the clerk's office to ensure, first, of, first and foremost, that the paperwork or, or whatever electronically work needs to be done right away so that woman can have or that person can have that that order protection in their hand. I, I There is just too many cases that, that you know, that, that slip, by the way, uh, for uh, these, these uh, anything that can go wrong. And I think, uh, again, from day one, having a real connection now and bringing and closing that gap between the office of the clerk and all the other entities like the public defender's office, like the chief justice office, the, you know, the sheriff's office, the state attorney's office is very important for us to ensure that we are doing everything as quickly as possible because that it could be a matter of life or death. Okay. Thank you so much. And, uh, the last audience question, um, is, um, can each of you speak uh, to why young people in particular should care about this position and what you plan to do to engage young people if elected? Um, Candidate Boykin. Thank you very much. That's a perfect question. Look, uh, this is an important office. It's important from the standpoint of access to justice. Too many of, uh, of those individuals who are going through our court system are individuals who are African Americans or Latinos. And quite frankly, uh, African-American males, they have a disproportionate contact with our system. And so we want to make sure that, um, that we do a program. I want to do a strategic initiative uh, in the Chicago public schools, in the city colleges of Chicago, where we actually go out and do outreach into the schools. And we talk about the role of the clerk in our justice system, because too many people don't understand what the clerk's office does. And quite frankly, their first touch point in the justice system is the clerk's office. And I talked about how that touch point can either make them or break them. It's a, it's a life-altering moment. And so we got to make sure that they understand what that system is. And hopefully by understanding it, they won't have to worry about going through it unless they get the traffic ticket or something like that. But if they do, they'll be able to pay that traffic ticket from their phone. They won't have to worry about coming in to pay that traffic ticket once I'm the clerk. And I will say this, that we got to do more to protect the rights of individuals who are coming through our system. Look, folks who have barriers to translation issues, we got to deal with that. We got to deal with those young people. They need hope, and I will do everything I can to engage young people as I did as a county commissioner. While a county commissioner, I held more town hall meetings than anyone else. I did everything I could on the issue of gun violence to, to make sure that we deal with that in nine to ten communities throughout our county where it's uh, exploding. But uh, we are the hope for the young people, and I want to make sure that uh, we have an office that works for them. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Candidate Kabanarji. Yeah, I, we've, we've all talked about the, the, uh, the clerk of the court's office um, and the important work it does, but it's, and again, we've talked about it here too, it's not as visible as some of the other offices that young people may engage with, but it affects their life in a lot of ways. Um, I think one important uh, thing that young people need to understand about this office is the clerk has a seat at the criminal justice table. The, seat, the, the, the clerk works with the state's attorney, interacts every day with the sheriff's office, interacts with the chief judge, and I would have a much more assertive and forward-looking seat at that table than our current clerk. Um, and we've talked about 
that here in many ways, and not only embracing technology, uh, but really training the staff to be the frontline representatives for those people who have to interact with the office. Uh, I'll give you one example, and it's in my reform plan, and we talk about it uh, at length in there, which is as of January 1st, the law of the land is cannabis expungement. Uh, for nonviolent possession. Um, I've already talked to the staff at Code for America who've been working here in Chicago for about six months. They've been working with Kim Fox, our state's attorney, um, and Kwame Raoul, and building out a system to make sure that cannabis expungement happens 100%. I have real concerns uh, that we're get, not getting 100% expungement. So uh, the, the, the governor, uh, the attorney general, and the state attorney can expunge a record, but ultimately that record is held by your clerk of courts. So I'll, I'll see to it that if your record is expunged, that booking photo is expunged. That detective's notes are expunged. All the records relating to the arrest are expunged. Currently, they, uh, the expungement is processed with the Illinois State Police. When I'm clerk of the courts, people who have been the victims of the drug war will realize that record is going to be expunged 100%. Thank you so much. Uh, candidate Martinez? Um, one of the things that, um, you know, as someone that um, had to – really step in. Uh, some years ago, my daughter was actually beat up by her boyfriend, and um, she was hiding because she did not want to tell me. And I remember coming home from Springfield and uh, finding her bruised up and asked her, well, what happened? And she goes, well, so-and-so beat me up. And I, why? Um, I, you know, she couldn't even answer. And right then and there, I said, you know what? This I will not allow. I, will not. I personally took her to the police station to file a report, and then I actually went and got a uh, and got a, a order of protection for my daughter, but more important, uh, we made sure. And my, my daughter, my my daughter now talks about it. It's been years. Uh, talks about it how she wants to continue to advocate for that, and how we have to educate our young. I go to the different schools, high schools, and colleges to talk about domestic violence. To talk about you know what you know what what our court system is about when it comes to domestic violence or, you know, or the fact that, you know, um, how to, uh, for young girls to feel that an order of protection is not enough. Uh, we have to continue to educate our young, uh, our young students in college and in, in high school and in college about that the, 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 the clerk's office is a friendly place to go to, to get information. Right now, people are too afraid because they're, they're afraid of what might happen when they approach that office. That's why I say I keep saying it over. Training that front line is going to be so important because that's the first order of contact with the judicial system. So to me, it's important that we continue to educate our young, our young men and women about, you know, what the clerk's office does and how they can be part of working and ensuring that the education on what's what needs to be put out there, what the clerk office is about, and what they're capable of doing for individuals is important. Uh, so I think that you know uh, our young folks, uh, we need to continue to educate them and, and 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 also train their minds as to what the clerk's office is a is a good place to visit with you know with. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, and candidate Meister. Um, thank you. Very much. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, what, can each speak about why young people should care about this position in particular and what you plan to do to engage young people more if elected? Well, OK. So I personally teach a um, and have taught semester long courses in to sixth, seventh and eighth graders in CPS schools and mock trials. And we do for the whole the, the whole semester and we teach about the court system, how the court system works you know, how, how to interact with the court. And then we end up over at the Daily Center at the end of the semester, and they put on a whole mock trial that we've rehearsed and we've worked on with them for the, the whole semester. And it's a great experience, and it's very eye-opening to try to understand what our youth feel about the court system and what their understanding is. Um, I think we need to do a better job of doing that, you know, into the course we brought, I brought uh, judges in who, you know, when these kids actually meet a judge, they see a courtroom, they interact in a courtroom, they see their parents sitting in the jury box acting as jurors in the trial. That's meaningful. And I think we have to do a better job of making sure our kids understand what the judicial process is. And I think we have to do a better job of, of of allowing them to understand that the courts actually can be humane places. You know, one of the things I have in my access to justice is that we need to have social services actually available in the courthouses because 
let's face it, when somebody is faced with a court, it's because they're being evicted, child custody, uh, foreclosure, child support. And it's at the low points in their lives where they interact with our court system. And our courts are great at being able to administer justice. But once justice is administered, we have to make sure that we have resources available, not that the courts are providing them, but that we have social service agencies located in our courthouses. Every judge I've talked to loves the idea. I think the clerk's office needs to. That's time. Thank you so much. All right. So thank you for uh, diligently answering all of these questions. Uh, We'll move on to the closing statements now. Um, You each have two minutes. Um, Candidate Meister, go ahead. You can start. Thank you. And thank you once again for for this wonderful forum and opportunity to uh, allow candidates to share their visions for the clerk's office. Um, I said it when I started and I'm saying it again, that the clerk's office is really ground zero of of corruption in Cook County. And I think we have our face right now with an opportunity that we haven't had for 20 years to determine the course that the clerk's office is going to follow. We need to fix it. We all agree operationally. We've got, I've got a plan. Ethically is probably the most important thing because you can't fix a broken system until you fix what is, is wrong. And to me, the ethical challenges that this office faces need to be tackled up front. We need an outsider. We've seen with the election of Lori Lightfoot and Fritz Kagi that the voters are demanding clean, good government, uh, free from ethical constraints. We cannot allow this office to continue to be steeped in party politics, machine politics, and pay to play. Um, I'm, I'm the one who's practiced in this court for 29 years. I'm coming to this office and running for this office as I did four years ago because I desperately want to see it fixed up. I see the problems every single day. I know the office in intimate detail, and that is what's going to allow me to hit the ground running day one. No studies, no no audits. We know what's what's wrong with this office. Dorothy Brown identified the problems in her transition plan in 2020. And many of those problems are the same thing today that they were then. We have to have the will to change it. I hope you will support me, uh, Jacob Meister, for Clerk of the Circuit Court. Thank you. Candidate Martinez, go ahead. Thank you very much. You know, efficiency and uh, transparency are the cornerstone for this, you know, for the successfully reforming the, the Cook County Clerk's Office. Um, you know, you hear, you've heard so much about the corruption, the mismanagement, but you know what? Like, it, that's behind us now. I think now the opportunity to uh, really go ahead and uh, and um, take over this office in a way that uh, we can actually make it, you know, a state-of-the-art Cook County, you know, uh, clerk's office, the best in the country, it's, it's possible. You know, and I'm prepared to lead this office. I'm prepared as an independent woman to making some hard choices, some hard decisions that need to be made there. I really feel that I am bringing my 18 years of experience uh, from from the state Senate uh, and also the fact that I have a background in public administration. I think that office just needs a real good administrator uh, to really perform what needs to be done. And, you know, and again, sunlight and transparency go a long way in changing the culture. I keep saying that the culture in the office has to change. If that culture changes, I think we will see some great things coming out of the clerk's office. I, you know, I'm committed to identifying ineffective, ineffectiveness, inefficiency, and I'm also the unfair uh, court management policies and procedures. There are a lot of things that we need to really correct in this office uh, moving forward. You know, I'm committed to increasing access to the court's system and improving the system's interaction with our court clerk's office. You know, people are afraid of our office today, and I think that that has to change. You know, I am committed to really working hard and making that clerk's office the very best that we can be proud of. And I really believe that I have the ability and the skills to do just that. So I ask that, you know, you support me in this race, uh, being the only woman. I think that, you know, we can clean up the place very easily. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Candidate Cabernardi. 
Uh, again, I want to thank the Chicago Appleseed Fund for Justice and its Executive Director, Malcolm Rich, who I didn't recognize before, Chicago Council of Lawyers and the American Constitution Society as well for presenting this today. Uh, we just, in our answers to the question about young people, we all agreed that this may not be a high-profile office, but you're doing a service to every voter today by having this. I also want to recognize the folks from League of Women Voters as well uh, who are here today. Um, Again, I ask for your support um, and consideration to be your next clerk of the circuit court because I've delivered on technology, transparency, and talent, and I've got a commitment of public service in my life, having worked for two U.S. senators, clerked for a federal judge, been an award-winning federal prosecutor, and now chair of your county board of review, where we delivered on the same successes that the clerk's office needs, embracing technology, taking your team of employees having them embrace technology and motivating them to the future and doing it in a transparent environment. I, I, one of the things I'm, I'm proud about, about our DAP system at the board, just to talk about that for, excess, uh, for a moment, is it's fully transparent. Okay, So y any homeowner or property owner who wants to look at our, our math, my hearing officers and lawyers who come up with the decisions. In fact, we had hearings this afternoon. Anyone can go in and see the calculations in the math. It's fully transparent. That builds confidence in the system. We talked about the scandals that have enveloped the clerk's office, and we talked about how that eroded the public's confidence in justice. Transparency, technology, and then having a, a, a workforce that is open and engaging, that rebuilds the public's confidence. I've done this before in one office. I can do it here again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And candidate Boykin. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank the sponsors as well for this candidates forum. I also want to thank uh, the fellow candidates for being here. I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here. Look, everyone deserves access to justice. And this is the most critical uh, touch point to our justice system. It really is the front door to our justice system. That front door ought to be wide open and welcoming for everyone. I want to make sure that uh, everyone who comes in contact with our court system, that we leverage technology for the benefit of all, to make life easier for everybody. I want to make sure that we expand services, especially those services we talked about earlier, expungement, that you know we do those things and do them quickly uh, for folks. We need a compassionate and a competent clerk of the circuit court. I am that person. You know, I'm reminded of something that Theodore Roosevelt said. He said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I care about our clerk's office. I care about the men and women who work in that office and who I think desire to do a good job. Look, with the right training, with the right motivation, with the right vision, they will rise to the occasion because they do all the time. And so I look forward to working with them. I look forward to working with you to take our clerk's office to the next level, to move it into the 21st century and to move it forward. I'm excited about this opportunity. I, I have a public servant's heart. That's what I do. And I look forward to working with you. When I was a county commissioner, I fought against corruption and I will do the same in this office. Thank you so much, and God bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all the candidates and to the sponsors of the forum. Let's give everybody a round of applause. And uh, was this, was this, uh, was there a video of this? Okay, well, keep your eyes peeled for a video recording that you can share with friends and family, etc. So thank you all for coming out, and uh, also pick up the Chicago Reader. We're still around, free every Thursday.